How's it going? How's everyone? I am uh, Gil Perkins, also known as Sage Salvo, and I'm going to present a literary analysis. It's a framework that we use uh, with teaching students uh, sort of how to cross context and read literature uh, just a bit, a bit more effectively. Uh, the program is called Words Live. Uh, we just started this year, so it is uh, very much still a startup. And we're going to go through some examples later, but also sort of get into the philosophy a bit uh, right now before we dig into some specific examples. Um, the base of the aim of the framework is to provide a better context. Now, we just heard from uh, Mr. Colin Powell, and he testified uh, that he was pretty much a C student uh, throughout all of his academic uh, career. And I don't think there's a, a soul in this room that would doubt his aptitude uh, or his intellect. But for some reason, there's a disconnect in performance. And the base of what we do is to sort of close that gap. And the philosophy is that it's really a context gap. You know, when students encounter literature uh, from centuries ago or mathematical problems that use things that are irrelevant to them in their lives, uh, that context barrier acts like a foreign language. And they're not able to read it. So the goal of our program is to use a familiar context to create a new portal so that they can read, they can understand, and they can synthesize knowledge better. Now, the context we're going to use is obviously something that's familiar to a lot of students, the current culture of the day, and it's hip hop culture. Uh, we think that the reasons why it hasn't really been examined is because we haven't, as a mass society, thought that there was anything relevant enough in hip hop to teach through. Uh, so we're going to show some examples of why, A, that's not true, but why, through analogy, we can honestly look at hip-hop as a literary uh, work uh, and look at it for its literary feats. And if uh, we look at it through that way, we can on honestly look at the, uh, the, the body of work in hip-hop as a literary period along the spectrum of all of our historical literary periods. And I propose that hip hop as a 40 year old body of work uh, actually should justly uh, be placed on a spectrum as a neo-romantic period. And there are some analogies we're gonna work through uh, that give the social context of the romantic period and the social context of the orientation of hip hop. And we'll go through some examples uh, in, in just a bit. Now, I get all, asked the question very often, how can you honestly justify hip hop as a literary work or these lyrics as a literary work. And I always go to the math first. You know. uh, so the average hip hop song is arranged in three stanzas or three verses. The average verse has 16 bars. This is hip hop 101 for those who, who have never sort of <laughs> dove into it. Uh, the average bar though has about 15 to 20 words. So you do the math and you end up with about a thousand words per song. And this is what you add in the chorus, add in the hook, add in all the ad libs. So an album, average of 12 track format, you're looking at a production of about 12,000 words. And anyone who's written 12,000 words can tell you that should be justified as a literary feat, whether it be in academia or whether it be in, 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 in other literature. So we've entered the realm of a literary composition at 12,000 words. Uh, and this is the beginning of the justification. Now, one thing we do with the students is we give lots of analogies because again, the goal is to create sort of this multi-context that they can view and look at very similar ideas across different contexts. So one analogy that we use is looking at the language economy much like the real economy. Now, I'm an economic student and very well versed on the real economy and there, we're focused on production. You know, we're not really worried about the fluctuation in prices. We're really, really looking at production. And the big thing there in that production possibility frontier, we're looking at efficiency. You know, how can you transform inputs into outputs? How can you expand output without having to actually go through increasing inputs? Efficiency is the key. And in this analogy, we look at our inventors, those people in the past, those scientists, who've allowed us to become much more effect efficient in our lives and lead, live easier lives. Uh, the analogy goes that we have a language economy. There's scarce resources in our language economy as well. There's an alphabet, finite number. There are grammatical rules. Uh, there are space constraints when you're writing. Uh, those are the scarce resources that we work within. 
Uh, and just like in our real economy, we're looking for efficiencies. We're looking for methods of communicating much more effectively, of describing something much more effectively, of communicating the depth of our emotions much more effectively. And in this way, our poets act as the innovators and the scientists do in the real economy. So this is sort of the importance of the poets. They give us more effective and more efficient ways of communicating ideas, describing scenes, uh, can, can, or making arguments. Uh, so that's sort of the analogy we start with uh, and alongside the, the justification of hip hop as a literary feat. Uh, so let's dig into uh, a few examples here. Uh, we're gonna start with a literary device called Epithet. And we're gonna look at H.G. Uh, Wells, uh, who is not a poet in your you know, classical sense, science fiction novelist, uh, many of you are familiar with, War of the Worlds and a Time Machine. This is an excerpt from The Time Machine. And when you're analyzing epithet, you're really analyzing a very, very effective literary device because this allows you to transfer a host of characteristics onto a person. And if you're dealing with a story or if you're dealing with a narrative that has a complex arrangement of characters or a complex system of ideas, it's a very, very good mnemonic device to use an epithet. And he masterfully uses an epithet. And if anyone who has read Time Traveler, you'll recognize these characters. The psychologist, the time traveler, uh, the medical man, uh, the, they're replete in this particular body of work. So history has acknowledged the literary genius of H.G. Wells. History has also acknowledged the mastery over the use of epithet in this particular uh, uh, composition. So we're gonna look at some hip hop examples of where epithet has been used. And I'm gonna ask you to perhaps become a little bit discomfort uh, for a few minutes as we go through some hip hop lyrics. Uh, I'll have them on the board projected, but we're also gonna hear them. And we've done our best to clean it up a bit <laughs> so that some of the language is not as offensive. Uh, so bear with us, uh, if you will. Uh, we're gonna use two different examples uh, one, the notorious B.I.G. with Jay-Z. The other is going to be another rapper named Nas with the game. And the reason why we use sort of uh, two examples with two rappers is because it shows the use and the understanding. Uh, and, and we'll break it down in, in just a sec. Play sound. So this particular verse saw the notorious B.I.G. create this character, Dark Skin Jermaine. And Dark Skin Jermaine has been given a host of unsavory characteristics. Basically, he's a social lame. He was a social leper. You don't want to be Dark Skin Jermaine in your social circle. Uh, so let's look at the understanding of, of Dark Skin Jermaine 10 years later in a composition uh, from Jay-Z. Play sound. Dark, dark, dark skin Jermaine, swayed in the rain, sort of kind of the same, except I'm no lame and you're gonna know my name. Before I go, the world will feel my pain. Stop sound. Now, in this composition, Jay-Z is explaining his social prowess or how he's socially advanced, and he's of the cool crowd. He says, I am no dark-skinned Jermaine. You, know, you guys are going to remember my name. And if you remember the Biggie composition, Biggie actually repeats, what's the guy's name again? You know, he's so irrelevant that he can't remember his name. And jay Z's saying, that's exactly who I'm not. Uh, so this is a 10-year span between the time that Biggie introduced dark-skinned Jermaine and the time that Jay-Z used Dark Skin Jermaine as a character in his story explaining who he's not. Uh, so let's look at another example. Uh, this is gonna be Nas uh, in 2001. Play sound. Ike with the Ivis in Jersey, light skin with herpes. This is Harlem, Brooklyn, and D.C. This is the problem, cause he never telling me got it from Come off right, cause Allen in 9-3. Stop sound. Now this is a much more grittier, grimier uh, subject matter. Uh, Ike with the Iverson jersey. So this is character building, and this particular character has an STD, and he is going around 
preying on women. Nas speaks about this character uh, in the community that he's dealt with in, in someone who you don't want to cross paths with. Uh, four years later, we have another rapper. The game invoked that same character uh, in one of his songs, Play Sound. I said never heard about Ike with the Iverson jersey. Ike with the Iverson jersey. Ike with the Iverson jersey. He got a cousin named Jason that rocked the Gary Payton out of same trifle. HIV patient, true story. Stop sound. So in a much more serious note, the game invokes the character Ike with the Iverson jersey. And in his story, it's actually a woman infected with HIV. So he recognized the character that Nas created and four years later invoked that character in this different song. Uh, so these two examples show the creation and also the understanding of these character developments. Uh, this is along the same way, it's analogous to what H.G. Wells did uh, in the time machine. So let's look through some other examples. Uh, we, we don't have a host of time, but this is part of uh, what we do in the program. Uh, stream of consciousness is one of my favorite devices because this particular literary, literary device allows you to dig into the mind of the protagonist. And it's always a, a bumpy ride and an adventurous ride where you can get into the mind of someone. Uh, on your left, you have T.S. Eliot. Uh, and on your right, you have Lupe Fiasco, uh, personally one of my favorite rappers. Now, we're going to dig into their respective usage of uh, stream of consciousness. We have, in 1915, T.S. Eliot composes a love song for Alfred Prufrock. And some of you may recall this particular poem. It was one of his, I think, first famous poems that he, that he penned. Uh, but in this, he takes the stance of the protagonist who is attempting to, to woo a woman, a love interest, a targeted love interest. And the protagonist is so neurotic, he almost talks himself out of it. And he's going down all the reasons why he shouldn't do it and why he should doubt himself. You hear the repetitive, do I dare, do I dare. Uh, he's worried about how he's dressed, speaks about his coat, speaks about his necktie, uh, and you can almost feel uh, his apprehension in approaching this young woman. Oddly enough, Lupe Fiasco uh, has a song called Sunshine where he does exactly the same thing. Play sound. You did fresh, uh-huh, yes she is. Had a feeling that it would be a day like this. The orchestra in my mind don't play like this, nah. But I'm prepared for it, got a little red for it. Brushed off my ears, even cut my hair for it. Cause normally I don't care for it. Don't even be looking for like, like that. Then they go, yeah, right over there. So I'm prepared to pour it. Little scared, my stare lowered. Mama said, have no fear. Plus I'm already out of my chair. Gather up my ears on my square from here forward. It's Nothing right, so here go it. Whisper in the air, it's kind of crowded in here. Wish you cared to blow it. She said, yeah. In sound. Lupe invokes, brushed, cut my hair, brushed off my ears, which are the shoes. Uh, so he's invoking this sort of consciousness about the way he looks, talking himself out of it. I should have no fear. My mother said, just go right ahead. So you dig into the mind of him as he is going through his apprehension about his targeted love interest as well. Uh, so in our program, we would compare and, and juxtapose these two pieces to teach the stream of consciousness uh, literary technique. And these are just some of the examples of a growing database uh, that we have collected uh, called Words Live. Uh, so I hope you enjoyed it. And this is what we feel could be uh, an innovative program and in using familiar context uh, to teach virtually everything. Thank you.